Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, you know, when I was asked to talk, I said, oh, great, you want to talk about thyroid and parathyroid disease? Because I will say as an endocrine surgeon, OBGYNs are the only ones who actually feel people's neck and detect thyroid nodules, so strong work. Um, I don't think anyone else actually knows how to do a thyroid exam. Um, you know, so I thought that that's what I would be here. Uh, but when Dr. Rice talked to me, she said, uh, I had given a talk um, uh, at the medical school about engaging medical students in research, and she thought that that would be a great topic to sort of focus on as part of your early career uh, development program for your department. And this talk really has nothing to do with OBGYN. It's entirely about my practice about endocrine surgery. But really what my goal is just to sort of highlight how I have engaged students in research for my own program, and really that that research has actually had a pretty meaningful impact on sort of where I am and how I practice today. So my hope is just to sort of highlight to you why engaging students can actually be a meaningful experience and sort of what that can actually have as an impact on your career moving forward. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the value of engaging students in clinically oriented research, describe how those research projects can actually have a real impact on the care of patients, and help you to sort of brainstorm and think about how you might be able to identify some clinically relevant questions that can be addressed through clinical research. So why should we as physicians do clinical research? You know, I think we all as physicians strive to take the very best care of our own patients. But there is a limit to how many patients we can individually care for. So we have to think about if we're going to commit our career to a certain area and really try to make an impact of what we do, that's what research can do. It can allow us to not only improve the care of the patient that we're seeing every day in clinic, but to somehow improve the care for all the patients with that disease. And I think if you think about that as the motivation to try to pursue research, it becomes a much more meaningful uh, endeavor for you to take on. So how do you identify your research focus? And I know when I first started on faculty, I thought, well, I don't even know what questions to ask. And then I listened to my patients. You know, I went to clinic, and they asked me questions, and I didn't have all the answers. And then I thought, you know, if I'm supposed to be the expert, and this is what I'm specializing in, and you have a question, and I don't know the answer, then isn't it my obligation to try to figure out that answer? And that was what really started most of my research projects. So what are some of the benefits of that clinical research? I think it has helped me to find the answers to the questions that I encounter every day in clinic. So every day in clinic, now when patients ask those questions, I know the answers. And I can not only give them an answer, I can quote them the data from our institution because I've looked at it and I know the answer to that question. So I'm not just saying I've read in a book or in theory this is what the answer is. I can say at our institution, in my experience, this is exactly what that answer is. So I think the research that I have done over the course of my career, which has really shaped the care of the patient of all the patients that I see. So how can I make an impact doing research? You know, when I started, I didn't have any research expertise, and I didn't have an advanced degree or training, I didn't have an MPH, I didn't have a PhD, and I thought, well, how can I do research, and how can I do research that has value? And I thought, you know what I want to do is I want to improve the care of my patients. I want every patient that I take care of next year to do better than the patients I did this year because I've analyzed my outcomes, I've learned from it, and I've gotten better, and I've tried to move the field forward. You know, my thought was is that at the end of my career, I want hopefully the field to be a little bit better off or my patients to be better off because I took the time to invest in doing the research. So I really think that tying it to the quality of care and allowing me to think about how I'm going to improve my own practice has been my motivation to do research. And so I thought, you know, whether it was a large-scale database or a small-scale data set, it didn't really matter to me as long as the end outcome of that project was that it had a direct impact on how I cared for patients. So I think a lot of people sort of have methodologic expertise and sort of do broad-scale studies, but I don't necessarily see how that data applies to the patient I'm seeing in clinic tomorrow. And so I would say that the focus of my research has really been more at the individual level. Every project I've done has allowed me to shape how I care for that patient and understand what's in their best interest long term. So how have we done that? And I would say that a clinical database is how I've been able to do most of this research. And what we did is, uh, many years ago, almost 20 years ago, developed a prospectively <coughs> maintained internal database that tracked all of our patients treated for a certain disease or undergoing a certain procedure. And we've used this for quality improvement and we've used it for research. And so why would you use a clinical database? And I think part of the reason that we've used it is it's quality data. Um, it's entered prospectively. So every patient that I operate on, there's 50 variables I type into a database about that patient and I track prospectively. 
It's entered by me, it's not entered by a coda, so I'm not relying on somebody else's assessment of whether there's a complication or what the, the value was. I'm saying this is what happened and this is what ex the patient experienced. It also gives you a diversity of data. You know, because it is able to be linked to the EHR and the electronic health record, I'm able to follow individual patients and time. So I can look at a patient I operated at 10 years ago and now go back to their EHR and sort of look at updates and sort of see where they're at or to see what the impact of what I did 10 years ago is. It also has been hugely helpful for our group for quality improvement. I can track individual outcomes for patients and for my surgeons. You know, I know now whose complications rates are and what they are over time and what modifications are in practice have led to lower complication rates or higher complications, and we can assess that. So it's not only been able to translate to research projects, but it's been a great tool for us to sort of evaluate our practice over time. So I think that these clinical data sets can answer questions that administrative data sets just simply can't because I think they can look at outcomes other than mortality or complications, which is what a lot of the large national data sets track. And they can look at patient-centered outcomes, things like symptom resolution or complication resolution. Um, it also looks at the treatment of benign disease. You know, a lot of the things I treat are benign conditions, and there are no national registries that want to track people who have benign conditions. So if that's what your primary practice is, a clinical data set may be what allows you to answer those questions. It also allows us to evaluate changes in practice. You know, the way I do things today is nothing like I did 10 years ago when I first started. And the reason is, is because we've looked at it, we've been able to analyze it and see how changes in practice over time have led to improvements in care. Um, it also allows us to evaluate differences in intraoperative or perioperative management. You know, maybe within your practice, there's two different surgeons who do things different ways. It's really easy then to compare outcomes of A to B and see which approach might be better. Or maybe you decided to change your practice. You know, we've done that with several interventions and we just say, okay, this is how we used to do it and now we do it this way and we're gonna compare these two cohorts of patients to see which approach is best. So the endocrine surgery database is what we've developed and this was approved in 2001 and we started doing prospective accrual of data um, and then we had retrospective approval when we started it to add patients back to 1984. Um, so we have three main organ databases and we enter prospectively every patient with parathyroid, thyroid, or adrenal surgery that we do. So now we have over 7,000 patients in that data set. So as much as this is an internal data set, when you start it, it builds. And this data set now is incredibly powerful because now I have a data set of 7,000 patients that have over 50 to 70 variables on each patient. And I have the ability to link that to the electronic health record. So if there's other information that we didn't collect prospectively, I can always go back and add it. So what this has allowed us to do is to mentor independent research projects for a, for a bunch of medical students. We've had over 46 medical students who've taken on projects from this database, and that's led to 53 first author publications with medical students as a first author. And I would say that, you know, for most medical students, taking on a research project is something they want to do, but if they could get a first author publication out of it, that's a pretty amazing thing. It really helps to boost their CV and makes them competitive for residencies, and that's what they're looking for. And I think because we've built this data set, and it's there, and the students know the track record of success, they are always looking for opportunities to come work with our program. So I think the, the key is, is that these projects that they have, as much as they've been a two or three month project over the summer and it's a small project, I think that they've really identified clinically important questions and provided answers, and I think it's really shaped and influenced the care of my patients. You know, when I was putting this talk together, I was thinking about how I care for an, a patient, and I'm gonna walk through some examples of that, and just how in an individual patient with a condition, how many aspects of that patient's care are actually directly influenced by a project that a medical student did with me. So I wanted to talk about that, and I think the best way to kind of highlight how this research can actually change the way I care for a patient is to just highlight some examples of patients. So, I'm going to see a patient this afternoon, she's a 36 year old woman, she's got Hashimoto's thyroiditis and she's been having some compressive symptoms and so she's coming to see me. And her thyroid function is normal and she gets a neck ultrasound and it shows a multinodular goiter. She's got some lumps and bumps in her thyroid. This is a very common scenario. And she's concerned about the risk of cancer as her sister was recently diagnosed with thyroid cancer and now she's been told she has nodules so she's of course appropriately worried. So she's coming to see me for additional evaluation. So how do I assess her risk of cancer? 
I would say that I had a project by a medical student who looked at what are the predictors of cancer in patients with multinodular goiter. She's got a multinodular goiter. So I can tell her that the risk factors are young age, male gender, and that over half of these cancers aren't diagnosed <coughs> preoperatively. What's the incidence uh, based on the fine needle aspiration based on her age and gender? Well, I can say that she's a young woman, so her risk of cancer for a given FNA is actually going to be much higher. And actually, the peak incident is women in their 30s. You know, and this family history of thyroid cancer, I can say that a positive family history actually increases the aggressiveness of disease. So now that I can talk to this patient, thanks to these three students, I can tell them that while the risk of malignancy in a multinodular goiter isn't high based on her age and her family history, her risk is higher than normal. And I would recommend a, a biopsy of her nodules. So we went and did that. We went and performed an FNA on three nodules. One of them came back non-diagnostic, one of them came back benign, and one came benign with herthal cell metaplasia. So she comes back to discuss it. And I have to say, what do those mean? And I can tell her, based on Nick's project, that a non-diagnostic fine needle aspiration the risk of cancer is actually twice what it should be. So non-diagnostic doesn't necessarily equate negative. The risk of cancer is much higher than it should be. Um, and what's this Herthel cell metaplasia? The pathologist put it in the report and nobody knows what it means. It actually means nothing. Uh, I wish they wouldn't put it in there, but thanks to Kevin, he looked at it and it means nothing. So now I can tell the patient they shouldn't put it in there, it just means nothing, they ignore it. Um, so, thanks to Kevin and Nick, I can now tell her that an FNA of her lymphomaplasia is a benign finding. Don't worry about it. However, the non-diagnostic biopsy is a little bit concerning, as it's going to double your risk of cancer. And I would repeat that biopsy. And especially given your family history and your compressive symptoms, it's not unreasonable for us to contemplate doing thyroid surgery. So the patient then says, "Well, do you really think surgery is going to improve these compressive symptoms that I'm having?" Well, thanks to Katie, she looked at this. Should patients with symptomatic thyroiditis pursue surgery? And yet, 43% of patients have compressive symptoms and 90% improve. So I can tell the patient it's highly likely that surgery is going to help her compressive symptoms. So she says, but I've read that this inflammation associated with my Hashimoto's thyroiditis makes surgery harder and more risky, doesn't it? Well, you're right. Uh, you know, there is a higher risk of complications in patients with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And now I don't just tell her, I can quote her exact numbers of what that complication risk is for her for that condition. It is higher, and it's about double. I can also tell her that I can predict who with Hashimoto's is going to have the most difficult thyroidectomy and have the highest rate of complications based on how high her thyroglobulin antibodies are and her TPO antibodies. The higher those antibodies are, the higher the risk of complications. So thanks to those two students, Kim and Val, I can tell the patient that surgery is going to be more difficult and the complication rate may be slightly higher and we need to fact that into our decision about whether or not to do surgery or not. So the patient says, I think I want to have the surgery, but where's it going to be done? Is it going to be in the hospital? Is that where I'm going to stay? And I would say that we looked at that. So we used to do half our surgeries in the main OR and half of them in the outpatient center. And I had a student looked and showed that the efficiency was over 50% 50, 50 faster turnover rates if we did the exact same case mix in the outpatient surgery center versus the main OR. So we switched our entire practice to the outpatient surgery center. And then I was, patients used to go to a short stay unit or they used to go to our assigned general surgery unit. And it was very clear to me that when they were in a dedicated short stay unit, their discharge process was 100 times faster. And so I had a student look at that and show that it doubled the likelihood of an early discharge prior to noon. So these were projects that students did. And ironically, after we did this, um, we, you know, we moved all of our patients to, if they stayed in the overnight hospital, to a short stay unit. And what was interesting is the hospital tried shutting down the short stay unit uh, about maybe four years ago. And I got this piece of paper, this paper that this medical student went, and I went to the eighth floor. And I said, you want to get rid of that short stay unit? I'm telling you this is a mistake. Because I've looked at it, I've researched it, and I've told you that if you have this unit, my patients are twice as likely to get out of the hospital before noon versus if you put them to a general surgery floor. They read the paper and they reopened the short stay unit. So, you know, I don't think the student, when they took on this project, thought it was really that impactful. But that led to a first author publication, and it actually allowed us to get a, a unit reopened at UW Hospital because he had the data that could support the decision. So the patient then asked me, am I going to need thyroid hormone supplementation postoperatively? 
So I had a student look at, if we take out half the thyroid, what's the likelihood of their needing thyroid hormone replacement? And sure enough, if she's got Hashimoto's or TSH starting is above 1.5, she's gonna be at higher risk. But overall, about 14% of patients are gonna need thyroid hormone. We also developed a BMI-based algorithm to optimize thyroid hormone replacement. We looked at everybody, what dose they ultimately ended up, and then tried to figure out how we could predict that better up front. And so that was a student who helped us to develop an algorithm. And that algorithm is now incorporated in HealthLink. So when we dose somebody's thyroid hormone after thyroid surgery, it calculates the dose and what we predict based on the algorithm that our student developed. So I think based on those students, you know, we can tell them that they're likely going to need thyroid hormone after surgery, even if we only remove half of it. And that if we remove it, we're going to start her on what we think is going to be optimal based on our BMI, based on an algorithm that we've developed by analyzing our own patients. So I would say that we've continued to use this thyroid and hormone dosing algorithm for our patients and have in integrated into our electronic order set. And actually Dave Schneider, who's sort of taken this to the next level, has actually developed an app that's now available on the web and is freely publicized for everyone across the country to use to dose patients with thyroid hormone. <coughs> Again, that project all started with the students sort of looking at our database and trying to de develop that preliminary data. So the patient then undergoes a thyroidectomy. And our protocol is we check a PTH in the recovery room and it is low. And then she wants to know what does this mean? And so, you know, we know that a low PTH can predict hypocalcemic symptoms and it can, and if we can effectively treat based on that level, we can prevent symptoms and ER visits. And that was done by a medical student, Linda. And then if it is low, the patient really wants to know what does this mean? What is my risk of a permanent complication? What is this going to be long term? And so I had Katie, a medical student, look at that. And we found that 18% of our patients did have a low parathyroid hormone level after surgery. So it's a pretty common thing. But 70% of them are going to resolve within two months. And over 90% of them are going to resolve within one year. So just because it's low after surgery doesn't mean you have a permanent complication. Most of these are going to resolve. But now I can at least tell the patient what to expect and what's the likelihood of recovery and the time frame to recovery. So I think that because of those two students, I can tell them that their pH is low, we know they're at risk for, for symptoms of low calcium, and we're gonna treat them preemptively to prevent problems and to reduce readmissions. And this resolves for most patients in a few weeks, but there's about a 10% chance they're not gonna fully recover. Um, so I would say we've developed and used this protocol for calcium and calcitriol supplementation after surgery, and based on this data, you know, our readmission rate after surgery using this protocol is now less than 1%. Because of this, we are able to predict who's going to have issues, preemptively treat them, and really eliminate the need for readmissions. It's also allowed us, because now we can predict who those patients are within a few hours of surgery, to shift our entire practice to an outpatient. It used to be that people after thyroid surgery would stay in the hospital a day or two waiting for these labs to see what happens. But now we know that the parathyroid hormone level just a couple hours after surgery can predict where that calcium is going to be in two days, and we treat empirically based on that, and we can now do everything as an outpatient. So she does do the surgery and her pathology comes back with a small thyroid cancer and she's scheduled to have thyroid ultrasounds and thyroglobulin levels as follow-up for that. And she's got these thyroglobulin antibodies and she wants to know how that's gonna impact her follow-up. And, and we know that it makes thyroglobulin unreliable but we don't really know what happens to those antibodies. And so I had a student look at everybody with thyroid cancer and had antibodies and saw what happened. And we found that they did resolve typically by about a year and that by three years, almost everybody had resolved. And just having those antibodies didn't overall change her long-term outcome or prognosis. So I think thanks to that student, I can really give her some information about what those antibodies mean and that we can follow them. And it doesn't necessarily mean that she still has cancer just because she has detectable antibodies. So if I think about then the impact of student research on the care of a thyroid patient, and I think it really has impacted every aspect of how I care for those patients. It helps me in my preoperative counseling, how to interpret the FNA results, how to determine the best and most efficient location for me to deliver the services. It helps to improve the safety, optimize their postoperative follow-up, and it facilitates their long-term follow-up. So if I think about that patient, pretty much every aspect of that patient's care has been in some way impacted by a, a student that I've involved. And each of those projects seem like a very small you know, piece of the puzzle, but as we put it all together, it really helps to shape the care of how we provide care for patients. 
So I think the key point is that research does impact practice. You know, this was actually my very first Shapiro student project. My first year on faculty, I did um, a total thyroidectomy as a treatment for Graves' disease. And we showed that complication rates were low and cure rates were high. And I presented this data to our endocrinologist. And they said, oh really? We thought it was too risky. So they started sending patients for surgery. And they started sending a lot of patients. And then they started seeing that, wow, these really do do well and they're really happy. And so prior to this surgery, less than 20% of people were choosing thyroidectomy for their Graves' disease. Now, uh, after four or five years after the study was published, over 50% of people at UW are choosing surgery as their primary treatment choice for Graves' disease. So that's a pretty huge shift in our practice dynamics and our institution, and I can credit that to a single project by a medical student my first year on faculty. Um, so I think that you know when you publish this data and you make it visible, it also changes referral patterns and practice patterns. So the other thing that we've done is that our parathyroidectomy <coughs> volume at UW has increased over sevenfold since 2000. Um, we have gone from less than 50 parathyroids a year to uh, over 350. And, and how do you build that practice and how does that happen? And I would say that research has been an absolutely critical component of promoting our program and, and the growth of our program over that time period. And so if I think again about a patient with parathyroid disease, I think medical students and research has had a huge impact on our practice there. You know, I think I've had students look at whether symptoms correlate with lab abnormalities. The students or patients always wonder that. My labs aren't that bad, but I have terrible symptoms, or, you know, how, how do we predict? And what we found is there's no correlation. We've also found that, ironically, some of the most symptomatic patients, the patients with the most profound neurocognitive dysfunction, had the mildest disease and were the most likely to have mild hyperplasia. Interesting thing, we also looked at radiation exposure and showed that it didn't necessarily increase the risk of multi-gland disease. And in fact, those patients often developed adenomas. And so again, students have sort of helped us to sort of shape how we evaluate these patients. They've also looked at the value of the imaging. You know, we had a student look at ultrasound utilization for the imaging of parathyroid disease and how often we found thyroid nodules and whether or not it led to additional surgery or interventions. Um, you know, this is, we found that 29% of people actually had a thyroid nodule that we needed to do an FNA when we were evaluating them for parathyroid disease. But if we evaluated, only 4% ended up needing a concurrent thyroid. So we were just able to sort of identify the disease and sort of deal with it preoperatively so that we could know if we needed to do a combined surgery. We've also looked at the impact of things like Hashimoto's thyroiditis and being on thyroid hormone and whether or not that impacts the utility of imaging such as system IMB scans. So I would say students have even been able to address things about intraoperative decision making. You know, we've had them look at, you know, interpretation of intraoperative PTH levels, um, you know, whether or not patients beyond Sinicalcid affects our ability to use intraoperative PTH testing. And when we cryopreserve these parathyroid glands, do they ever work or do we ever need them? And the reality is, is we had cryopreserved 442 glands and we had only tried to auto-transplant four of them and only one of them worked. So I would say the return on investment of that approach was probably not very good. But we didn't know because we hadn't looked at it. But thankfully a student spent the time to look at all those charts and realized, boy, you guys do this all the time and you never use it and it doesn't work. Well, thanks. Um, so we also have had students look at some of the benefits of parathyroid surgery. You know, we've had a student look at quality of life improvements in patients with parathyroid disease. Uh, I had a student look at the timing of symptom improvement. She followed up with patients and asked at two weeks, six weeks, six months, when do those symptoms get better, if they are going to get better. Um, and then I also looked at sort of whether or not the parathyroid level was elevated after surgery and whether or not that had an impact on how they improved symptoms. So I think if I look at the impact that research has had on a patient with parathyroid disease, just as we had in thyroid disease, I think it's helped me with preoperative counseling. It's helped me to determine which image modalities we should be using. It actually guides how I approach things interoperatively and how I approach that data. It assists us with some of the interoperative decision making. And I think it's also helped me to illustrate to patients some of the benefits of surgery. So what is the benefit to you to engaging students in your research? Now I would say that students are an incredibly smart and capable workforce. Um, and I think the nice thing is, is they come in with a basic knowledge and understanding of medical diseases. 
Um, but beyond sort of the understanding of the medical terminology and sort of what's important, they also are really capable of generating some really great questions because they have enough understanding to question what you're doing or say, well, why do you do that? It doesn't make sense. Or I read something else. Or, you know, I would say a lot of the things that I've done or projects I've come up with because a student, as I'm explaining to them what we do or why we do it, they don't understand it. And they ask really great questions, which stimulates me to say, maybe, maybe I have just been doing that because that's how I've always done it and I haven't really thought about it. So I think they're really good at sort of stimulating research questions. I think they also understand the value of participating in research. You know, I think one, they're looking for experience and, and opportunities, but they also understand that by answering these questions, we're going to help to move the field forward. Um, and probably the best is they're willing to work for really hard and for little to no pay. You know, I think finding qualified people to assist with your research is always hard, and especially if you don't have a lot of independent research funding. You know, you're never going to find somebody smarter, more capable, and more hardworking than a medical student who is willing to work for as little pay as they're willing to work for. Um, you know, so that's the that's the huge plus. Um, but there is a value for the students. So the reason they do it for little to no pay is because they perceive other benefits of it. And I would say that these students want to learn the fundamentals of research. They want to learn how to collect data, how to do some statistical analysis. They have never written an abstract or a manuscript before or given a presentation on their work. So what seems like a mundane small task to them is a huge opportunity to really practice what it's like to put together a PowerPoint or to write an abstract or to just teach them those basics. Um, it increases their competitiveness for residency. You know, those students that I showed, very few of them have gone on to general surgery or the endocrine surgery. They've gone into ER and, you know, orthopedic surgery. One of those students got into his top orthopedic surgery residency and he wrote me a thank you note saying that the reason he got in or that they were so impressed with his research accomplishments as a medical student. They were research about endocrine stuff, but they didn't care to show that he had been productive. So it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly what they're interested in. Now that being said, as I have to have a caveat, is now two of those students just interviewed for my endocrine surgery fellowship this year, which was a pretty cool thing to sort of see as you stay in practice long enough that those people went on to a general surgery residency, completed their general surgery residency, and now have decided they want to go into endocrine surgery and came back to interview for my fellowship. So it's kind of cool. So it does sometimes, sometimes, you know, it does actually stimulate not only a lifelong interest in academics and research, but actually in the field that they researched as a student. Um, and then students actually benefit from navigating the, the EHR. You know, a lot of these projects involve going into the EHR and looking up patients and querying data, and we think that's mundane, mindless work, and it's painful, and who wants to do it? Students actually want to do it, and they actually benefit from it, because especially if they're a preclinical student, you know, a student who works with us over the summer and gets really facile at navigating the EHR and finding information is a huge step ahead when they start on the, on the wards and the clinical wards. So for the students, it's actually not wasted time or effort. Um, and, I, and my hope is, is that you might be able to spark a, a lifetime passion for doing research. Um, like I said, while I'm really excited that those two people are applying for endocrine surgery, I'm even more impressed to see their research accomplishments and what they've been able to do, and now they're applying in faculty positions that really have a significant research component that we kind of stimulated and, and got them inspired to want to do this as part of their career going forward. So in summary, I think you know, performing clinical research is an important part of our job as physicians. Um, and I think that clinical research can help us to help define the best care for our own patients and, and also to help improve the care of all the patients with that disease. Um, medical students, I think, really can play a critical role in research projects during their training. And, and I think the impact of their involvement can actually lead to lasting changes in practice. I think I see the influence of their work in my clinical practice every day. And so I think as much as it seems like a small piece of the puzzle, when you put all those pieces together, it becomes a beautiful, you know, story. And so I think it's helpful to sort of help, you know, let students know that even though this seems like a very small question or a very small part, it's part of a much bigger piece of the puzzle. And when we put this all together, it's really going to help to shape how we are, we do things going forward. Um, so I think the timing of this is, is quite helpful because I don't know if you know is the Shapiro project proposals are going to be due in the next couple months. And so right now there are a bunch of first year medical students who are looking for mentors and looking for opportunities to take on research projects. And those are going to be due in early March. 
And so if you have an idea or you have a project that you think a student might be interested in taking on, submit a proposal, get your idea out there, meet with some students, and give them some opportunities. I would say that if you've never done it before, it's a really rewarding experience. And I think you learn a lot from the students, and, and, and I think they learn a lot from you. And so I encourage you all to consider that this year. And I just wanted to thank, uh, this is just a list of the students. I didn't highlight everybody's papers in, in the talk today, but these are some of the, uh, I just gave you some of the examples. But I just wanted to thank all the students and the impact that they've had on our research program. So thanks. I know this is a talk that doesn't necessarily lead to questions, but can I answer? Yeah, so it, I mean, it's one of those things is uh, from there's a lot of initial investment because I think one year I got to design it and I think initially we started it was a, an Excel spreadsheet or like a, a access database. Um, now we're using REDCap, which I would say that if you're going to do this, REDCap is probably the easiest format to do it. Once you set it up, it's pretty easy and it's just click boxes. Um, you know, I would say that, you know, we, we've tried different ways of direct entry into the computer, which seems to, because of the firewalls and getting logged into those systems in between cases, it's not always feasible for me. So we actually have a written form that I fill out. So as I'm doing my pre-ops on my patients the night before I'm reading about them and preparing them, I fill out that form and I circle all the boxes and sort of try to fill out all the basic information. Um, and then the day of surgery, there's a little section about, you know, intraoperative PTH levels, and I just sort of write those values in. And then when they come for the post-op visit, I kind of add post-op labs, post-op complications, sort of long-term follow-up. And then once they fill out that form, I, we now have hired a database person to help enter those. So we've had different variations over time. I've had full-time database managers. Right now I'm using student hourlies you know, that come in and they work an average of 10 hours a week and enter all those forms for everybody in our group. Um, and that's been the workflow that's worked the best for us. Um, I would say that initially when we started it, the surgeons all did it ourselves. And then we actually, part of our Summer Shapiro program was as those students, you know, we're gonna give you this database that's already created, but you've gotta do some work. So their first two weeks was spent updating any missing patients from the last year, cleaning up any missing variables. So part of it was getting them comfortable with the EHR and doing some work to sort of help build and maintain that database for us. And then once you did that two weeks of service to sort of help get things tuned up and get comfortable with it, then you could extract your own data set for your project. Um, so that actually worked fairly well for us to sort of use the summer students as sort of, you know, some help to sort of maintain and do some of the work to keep it up to date and then, and then sort of to maintain it. I think it was about 10 years after we started it when the students didn't accidentally, it was an Excel file and they accidentally sorted something wrong and then everything got mixed up and there was some mistakes that will never be corrected. And um, I think it was at that moment when we realized that now it's 5,000 patients that are all jumbled, that we needed to maybe not have it be an Excel file that went from student to student from long-term maintenance is just too big and too important of a data set. So that's when we hired a full-time research kind of database person. Um, and we just shared the costs through everybody in our group, took money from their research funds to sort of help fund that salary. Um, I think now that we're in SESQIP, or uh, SESQIP is our national quality registry, and so we use our database forms to enter in that as well. And so I would say now it's just the data entry in on those forms, which a student hourly can do. Um, we are working with Dave Schneider, one of my partners, is one of the informatics for the hospital, is we are trying to create all of our notes in EPIC to be smart forms so that all those variables that we are entering in our database are actually extractable from the EHR. So my hope is, is within the year, 
my templated note for parathyroid patient is going to actually have every piece of data that can then be extracted directly from the EHR and autopopulator database so that we can completely eliminate the need for us to do that. Because I think that that's the power of EPIC and the EHR, and I think we haven't quite gotten there. But I would say that um, I know our department is very invested in getting there because it's a lot of work to maintain these data sets and these quality registries. And so I think, you know, my hope is, is in the course of the next year that that, that functionality will be available. Yeah. Great, great talk. And you know, many of us have had these kinds of struggles with clinical databases, clinical registries. How do you, you know, what do you decide to do yourself versus going to the administrative data? So I guess I have a question about that um, because it sounds like a lot of your students did have to go back to the HR to supplement. Mm -hmm. So how have you been able to figure out sort of what to, what to really track in your own database versus projects that then need to, need to go back and you know, dig through charts? And, yeah, um, I think and it's, it's really tricky because if you try to make your database too big, then nobody can keep it up. It's too much cost and too much expense. But if you make it too small, then it can't even answer some simple questions yeah, I mean, I think it's it's really, you know, we're just going through now as we're sort of trying to figure out in Epic, what variables do we truly need? And some of those maybe were started 20 years ago and we know we've never used it for a project and we can't envision how we would use it in a project, so maybe we need to stop collecting some of that data. Um, but I think it's hard. I would say that, you know, sir, for, for the students, you're right. Most of them, we say this is the initial data set. And at least by diagnosis, by pathology, we can identify the core cohort of patients that they need for it. And then we say, you know what, but what we, what we don't have is their thyroglobulin antibody levels. So here's the 150 patients that you could use for the study, but you're going to have to go back now and find the thyroglobulin antibodies on those 150 patients. So. Most of them end up going back and digging more on some aspect of it, um, unless it's something. And then if we find that we did it and wow, that was really valuable, we'll add it from that point going forward. And then we have used the student hourlies to then retrograde, go back and add some of those variables historically. Um, so I think it's always a balance, but I would say it's very rare where student comes and I just say here's an entirely complete, perfect data set that you don't have to do anything with. I would say that despite our best efforts to maintain this database, it's far from perfect. So I can give you a cohort to start with of names and dates, right. Exactly, it's like this is at least the starting point of it and then you, they still may want to go back and sort of verify information or get some additional variables or clarify things that are unclear. And so there's still gonna be some work, but I would say that's a lot less work than starting from scratch. You know, whereas if you don't have this, it's getting the request from you know, like HIM to say, I want everyone with this diagnostic code over this time period, and then generating the list, and then getting the list, and then having to say, you know, so at least it's a starting point. Exactly. It just makes the starting point easier and allows them to progress a little bit faster. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that that's been key for us is that we have a clinical research meeting uh, twice a month. And what we have is we have a running list of clinical projects based on the database. And partly it was to track things and hold us accountable. And so every two weeks we get together and we have a spreadsheet with 70 projects on it. And every project has the name of whose idea it was, you know, who's working on it primarily, who's the senior author, what the status is, is it in an abstract, is it in a manuscript, is it a presentation? It's capturing it, it's capturing it, figuring out who's working on it, and then for us, you know, I don't know how many times I've gone to that meeting and there's a project with my name on it and it was presented and then that manuscript just hasn't really gone anywhere. And every two weeks I'm asked, so where's the status of that manuscript, Becky? Yeah, I'm working on it. Yeah, I'll get it. You know, like, so it just forces us to follow through and it stays on that list until the manuscript's accepted. So for us, and then the other thing about that is so maybe a student did a project, never finished it. It's, it was presented, but the paper just never got across the finish line. So one of those papers I presented was a medical student who just couldn't finish it. One of our fellows, I said, this is a great project. They just haven't finished it. 
So he literally took it up, finished writing up the paper, submitted it, and got a first author publication in a journal with an impact factor of five. Like, I mean, it was a really, so for, for some of the residents and fellows who enjoy sort of getting things across the finish line, they can also look at this list and say, yeah, I'll finish all these. These are great opportunities, <laughs> right? You know, because if you just have them finish and then you, you want that person as a second author. Right, exactly. So it depends on how much work they do, whether they become the first author or they become second author, but it depends what it needs to get across the finish line. And, and so that's been a great technique, too, for us to sort of get things to, to, to completion. Thanks. That was one awesome uh, presentation. How do you, in a busy circle practice, find the time to consent the patients? Because we've had trouble with that. We've got limited time to talk to them about surgery and, oh, there's all these forms. Yeah, so I would say that our database is actually a prospective quality registry. So it has a kind of what we call blanket IRB. So we do not have to individually consent patients for part of it because it's considered a quality registry. And so we've registered it with the IRB. They know what we're collecting and we collect that data on everybody and we show them every year what we've published from it, what we've done with it, and sort of what we do not have to individually consent patients for participation in it. Um, so that is a huge plus for us. It's a quality registry. It's a quality registry, and we do absolutely use this for quality. I mean, we assess outcomes all the time and sort of make modifications, but that's been a huge plus for us. I would say one that Blanket IRB then allows, I want to work on a project, great, I can add you to the IRB and here's the data set tomorrow. Like, I don't have to have a three-month delay while we write in IRB and get it submitted and approved. So that's been a huge help for us, too. Our fellows start in day one. You know, they start, you know, August 1st, and the abstract deadline for the Academic Surgical Congress is in late August. Almost every fellow has been able to get something together and submit for a deadline three weeks after they start. And you can't do that if you don't already have that data set approved. So I think there's different different approaches over different times. So I would say that uh, when we started doing the spreadsheet, it was actually our secretary who maintained the Excel sheet, and then she would just print them out and bring them to the meeting and set them on the table, uh, so we could each have one. Um, uh, we ha and, and still, that's what happens is our administrative assistant sort of maintains it. Um, and then what we do is one of the people at the meeting takes notes about changes or updates that people give about projects and then they hand it back to our admin and she updates it and then prints it out for us the next time we meet. So it's a, and it's literally an Excel spreadsheet, so it's really easy. Um, we don't typically have an agenda for that meeting. We just know that we're coming. But it's also an opportunity, because we have that standing meeting, anybody who has a project, they can present it and say, this is what I'm working on, this is my thought process, or this is where we're at, or this is where we're struggling, to get input from the group. It's also where we do all our practice presentations before they go to a national meeting. So we have the upcoming Academic Surgical Congress, the residents and fellows who are presenting are gonna give their practice talks at that meeting so that everybody in the group can see it, give them feedback, and we tend to micromanage every slide. You know, change this, do this, do this, you know. But it's a good opportunity for them to get some very direct feedback before they go give a presentation nationally so that they're prepared for that. Um, and then what was the other question? Who maintains the slide diary and who does the staff Yeah, so the blanket IRB, we, I, I, I had to create initially. Um, we worked with some people in our departments who sort of help with IRBs sort of creation. So I worked with our department resources. And it, you know, it's, it wasn't an easy process to get it approved, but I would say that it wasn't that much harder than any other IRB I've ever done. <laughs> and so that one has had, you know, paid for itself, you know, uh, in, in the long term. So the upfront work was definitely worth it. And there are examples of those. So now in our department, we had ours approved. No, MIS has one. Colorectal has one. You know, like all the divisions have sort of mirrored a similar format for their blanket IRBs. Um, so the IRB is familiar with that format and is willing to approve those. Um, I would say for statistical analysis, it depends on the complexity of it. Um, because these are, you know, smaller data sets, and we're not typically doing 
really complicated, complicated, you know, so I would say I have SPSS on my computer, and I can teach somebody how to do a mean and a standard deviation and a t-test on SPSS. And so we can do that basic level. Uh, we do have department statisticians, and so they do a basic introduction to SPSS uh, calculations for the students during their summer research, so they can kind of get some basic methodology with it. Um, if they need something more complicated than that, we can get statistical consults, and then they're willing to help work with the students on doing that analysis. Um, some of my faculty are brilliant. Dave Schneider is a brilliant statistician, so he doesn't need help. So sometimes he'll help me with the project because I don't really know how to do it, but he does. And so I think as a group, we also, a lot of the faculty have that expertise. are being able to track. If we can just say that we need an additional piece of information to analyze, because like if I'm looking at recurrence rates, I'm going to have to look at my parathyroid patient's charts once a year in perpetuity. So we're allowed to go back to those charts to add additional information to sort of shape what would impact their outcomes. So um, I think we, I can't remember if we have to tell them every year like exactly what, if there was any additional variables that were collected on any patients. Um, but I think we're allowed within some realm. But isn't it true that once your students actually do a project, they have to get a separate IRB before they publish it? No. The students can be added. Even if you're not even getting an IRB exemption on the stuff that you're publishing, how are your quality data? No, so the quality database allows us to publish things no. based on that. So we have to submit a list of people who worked on projects and what publications generated from the data that's contained within it as an annual update to our, to our blanket IRB. So when a student comes on a project, we do add them to the IRB. So we make sure that they have their HIPAA training and their city training and all the things that the IRB would require to be added to the IRB before we would give them the data set. So once they do all those trainings, we add them to the IRB. And once the IRB approves their involvement in it, then we can extract the data and give it to them to work with. Hopefully I'm not breaking any ideas. <laughs> I mean, I can't say that I'm a perfect at this, but I would say that, like, I mean, I think we've gone through a lot of sort of algorithms over this over time and sort of how to do negotiate this with the IRB, but ultimately, you know, and I think partly the consent, and maybe we got out of this because when it was initially approved, it was initially a, it was a different, it, it had a different format initially when it was approved, and now this quality registry, I think, was in the last five years that they decided that that's actually how it should be termed because that's really what it is. Um, so I don't know if, if we change the terminology to that now, if they would require prospective consent, but I don't think so because we're, we don't know what we're consenting them for. We're consenting no, them to trade, yeah. I, it would be my own, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, they aren't requiring us to do a separate IRB. We can give an update on an annual basis of what things have been published from it and the names of the people that were involved in it. Yeah. I just want to make a couple of comments. Um, I think that uh, the I mean, honestly, just, you know, name, MRI.
our number of diagnosis, procedure, if there's biopsy results or something. You know, what are the key things? You know, for us, if I were to think about simplifying it for a thyroid, what operation did they have? What was their preoperative FNA? You know, what was their pathology? Because I would say most of the projects are going to involve identifying patients on one of those three things. And so if we just had that small of a data set, we probably could identify the patients that we would need for any you know, potential study. Well, thank you very much.